לא פחות חשוב. Hello, Marcus. Good morning. Good morning. How is London this morning? Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, it's a lovely sunny morning. We could be sitting in a whole lot, but um, we're not. We're sitting in London. <laughs> okay. Well, it's great to hear you. And uh, we're, uh, um, most of us are already online. There's about 40-something of us. And we have your Creativity Code uh, uh, ready on another uh, screen. And that's working uh, so, for people? Uh, I'd like to introduce you for uh, a little bit because uh, since we, we all, or most of us have met you before, so I'll be uh, quick. And Marcus had been a professor at Oxford after he was uh, uh, actually uh, got an extra IQ piece in the Hebrew U, right? <laughs> Um, we've seen all your distinctions in Wikipedia, but the one I'd like to note is that I wasn't aware that you were awarded the Piano Prize, uh, mm. which, which to me is, uh, um, is great, um, having been uh, a follower of the numbers theory, so I guess that's why you got it. Uh, and I think it's uh, the only time in the last 40 years that an Arsenal fan had seen some light in uh, Turin, right? <laughs> Possibly true, exactly. Well, I, I looked up. The last time you've seen the light of day uh, was in 1979. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll be introduced to the world of artificial intelligence. Uh, we've also asked you to share with us your thoughts on scientific knowledge. Um, and uh, we'll do that in the second part. And with your permission, we'll start with a few readings that uh, um, we'll do about half of those now and the other half of the other side. So, uh, Zev, would you like to call on the readers, please? רק רגע, יש פה שאלה מחלק מהמשתתפים לגבי הקוד. אז אני אומר עוד פעם, בלינק שכתוב אחרי הסלאש מצד ימין, Creativity Code, זה, אם אתם מרגישים עליו, כי רליק שלח שני קודים, שני לינקים, הלינק הזה שכתוב עליו קריאטיביטי קוד, תקישו עליו ואז הכל יהיה בסדר. אוקיי, הקטע הראשון, בבקשה. לא, הוא מבקש, זאביק. זה לא נכון, הוא מבקש, הוא מבקש עדיין את הקוד, גם בלינק הזה. אל תדאג, הוא יתחיל את ההרצאה והוא ינחה אותנו מה לעשות. לא, מה שאתה מחוץ לזה, זה 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 מבקש, אין פה גליסר קוד. בסדר, השורה, נכנסת לגליסר, הכנסת את השורה הראשונה, יש לה סלאש, תעשה, תעשה carriage return, ותכניס עכשיו creativity code, לא בתוך המשבצת, אלא פשוט מתחת לעל הגליסר. זה יכניס אותך לתוך, לתוך המצגת. הכי פשוט זה להקליט על מה שיש בצ'אט. תן לו קודם, דוד, תן לו שנייה לנסות את זה, אם זה לא יעבוד, אז תיתן לו עצה אחרת. בואו בוא נחכה דקה. גם אצלי זה לא עובד, אני בגלישר, ובגלישר זה אומר לי... לא, אל תיכנס לתוך המשבצת, אל תיכנס לתוך המלבן, מלבן, אלא פשוט שורה מתחת לגליסר, תכניס קריאטיביטי קוד. איזה קוד? לכתוב המילה קריאטיביטי קוד. אז מכניסים קריאטיביטי קוד, וזה אומר קוד אינוולד. אתי, כתבת את זה אולי עם רווח בין קריאטיביטי לקוד? בלי רווח, בין הקריאטיביטי. אה, בלי רווח, אוקיי. בלי רווח. בדיוק. בלי רווח. נכון. אוקיי, אני מבקש... עובד. אני מבקש מאהובה מייליק, אהובה או בני מייליק, לקרוא את הקטע הראשון, בבקשה. שומעים אותי? כן, דבר. מצוין. אז זה הקטע עם קבוצת הכדורגל או עם השחמט? עמוד 21, שוט. עם הכדורגל. עם הכדורגל, מצוין. כשהתבוננתי קצת יותר מקרוב בקבוצת הכדורגל של ריאל מדריד, התחלתי לחשוד שאולי על ספסל הקבוצה יושב גם מתמטיקאי. ניתוח מפורט של המצב מלמד שכאשר עבר לשם בקהם, כל כוכבי הקבוצה, שיחקו בחולצות עם מספרים ראשונים. קרלוס, מעוז ההגנה עם מספר 3, זידן, לב הקישור עם מספר 5, ראול ורונלדו הראשון הברזילאי, מובילי התקפה של ריאל עם המספרים 7 ו-11. היה זה כנראה בלתי נמנע אם כך, 
שבקהם קיבל מספר ראשוני, מספר שאליו הוא נקשר מאוד. כשעבר לקבוצת לוס אנג'לס גלקסי, התעקש בקהם לקחת איתו את המספר הראשוני, בניסיון לחזר אחר, אחר הקהל האמריקאי עם המשחק היפהפה הזה. יופי, הקטע הבא רלי, כי אנחנו ממשיכים. עיר הקוקייה, בבקשה. עירה? זנים אחרים של זיקדות, זנים אחרים של זיקדות נשארים מתחת לאדמה 13 שנים, ואחרים מסתפקים בשבע שנים. מספרים ראשונים. מדהים לי בכך כי גם במקרים שבהם זיקדה של 17 שנים מקדימה להופיע, היא לא מקדימה בשנה אחת, בדרך כלל בארבע שנים. כלומר, עוברת למחזור של 13 שנים. נראה שבאמת יש משהו הקשור למספרים הראשונים ועוזר לנציקדות השונים. אבל מה זה? המדענים עדיין לא בטוחים, ובכל זאת הופיעה ועלתה תיאוריה מתמטית שמסבירה את ההתמכרות של הצד למספרים ראשונים. ראשית, כמה עובדות. ביער נתון יש בדרך כלל זן אחד של ציקדות, כך שההסבר לא קשור לחלוקת משאבים זנים שונים. ברוב השנים עולה ומופיע, עולה ומופיע זן של ציקדות מספרים ראשונים במקום כלשהו בארצות הברית. ב-2009 ו-2010 היו שנים ללא ציקדות. בניגוד לכך, ב-2011 הראה יציאה נרחבת של ציקדת 13 השנים בדרום מארצות הברית. גם 2011 הוא מספר ראשוני, אבל איני חושב שהציקדות חכמות עד כדי כך. התיאוריה המוצלחת יותר שסגרה את מחזור החיים הראשוני של הציקדות, נוגעת לקיומו האפשרי של חרק טורף, שמופיע גם הוא בעת באופן מחזורי, באופן מחזורי. הוא, מתוזמ... הוא מתזמן את הופעתו כך, שתתאים להופעת הציקדות, ואז עולה את החרקים שעלו זה לו כבר. כאן באה לידי ביטוי הברירה הטבעית, שהרי ציקדות שמבסדות את חייהן לפי מחזור, הכרוך במחזור, במספר ראשוני, יש את הטורפים הרבה פחות בהשוואה לציקדות בעלות מחזור חיים הכרוך במספר לא ראשוני. תודה, אירה. והקטע השלישי, אני חושב שזה יהיה האחרון בקטע הזה של המפגש. צחי גלבוע, בבקשה. צחי? אני חושב שזה דני. דני שיריזלי. מה-91. המאה תשעים ואחת, נכון, טעות שלי. דני, שריזלי, אתה על הקו? דני? כן, שומע? שוט, דני, דבר. שומע, זו קפיצה דרך האמת חשובה. הוא הבין שהממדים הפיזיים של העיר בעצם אינם חשובים. מה שחשוב הוא האופן שבו הקשרים מחוברים זה לזה. אותו עיקרון תקף גם לגבי המפה הטופולוגית של הרכבת התחתית בלונדון. כל אחד מארבעת אזורי היבשה, המחוברים על ידי הגשרים של קניגסברג, ניתן לצמצום לנקודה, מה שהופך את הגשרים לקווים שמקשרים בין הנקודות. כך מתקבלת מפת גשרים של קניגסברג, בדומה למפה הפשוטה בהרבה של הרכבת התחתית בלונדון. כך מצטמצמת בעיית איתור המסלול שעובר דרך כל הגשרים לשאלה. אם אפשר לצייר את המפה הזאת בלי להרים את העט מן הנייר, לא לחזור על שוב כאן פעמיים. מנקודת המבט החדשה הזאת של אוליאר, הוא הצליח להראות כי למעשה אי אפשר לחצות את כל הגשרים בפעם אחת ויחידה. חלק, אנחנו נסתפק בזה עכשיו, בקשתה הזאת? כן, כן. מרקוס, you're on, please. Great. Well, it's wonderful to join you all again. if only virtually, um, and uh, so nice to hear some of the readings uh, you've been doing from this book, uh, The Number Mysteries. Um, I put a little link, actually, to um, a story in the BBC in the chat, uh, which is about um, some of these cicadas appearing in Virginia just five days ago. Um, so if you want to read about the cicadas uh, that were just mentioned in that reading. Uh, there's a link to the story uh, there. Um, you've been doing some readings from uh, my book, The Number Mysteries, but I was quite keen to share with you some of the work I've been doing on a new book, uh, The Creativity Code, 
which is about um, the impact that artificial intelligence is having uh, on our world today. Um, artificial intelligence, one of the great centers is uh, uh, here in Oxford, but also in Israel. A lot of very interesting work being done on artificial intelligence. And I think that um, uh, many stories in the media about the impact that this new technology is going to have on our society and a lot of fear, um, a lot of fear of jobs being taken away from us. Uh, is, is there anything going to be left for humans to do if AI can be so successful at driving cars, uh, surveying medical data, becoming our doctors, our lawyers? But I did think there was one place where perhaps AI would not be able to uh, steal from us, and that is our creativity. Our creativity seems to be something uh, uniquely about expressing what we are as humans, to be able to write uh, Mozart's Requiem or Shakespeare's Othello comes from a deep emotional conscious world. Uh, so how could AI ever be creative? Um, so, I got a little bit of a shock a few years ago when um, I saw a story uh, emerge where I realized that this new technology that is emerging actually might have the potential uh, to be creative. Um, this was uh, in a game that was being played. Um, so just to test out, hopefully your screens now, you should be seeing in the Glisser code, a picture of um, the game of Go being played by um, a South Korean uh, Lee Sedol. And um, well, there is a second person against him, but it, he isn't playing against the person. He's actually playing against uh, a bit of code. Um, so traditionally, this game of Go, which some of you may have played, it's uh, an ancient Chinese game. Uh, played on a 19 by 19 grid and the way you play the game is you put black and white stones down in turn and you try and use your stones to uh, enclose the other person's area <coughs> and the person who wins the game is the person who encloses more stones than the other. Um, so it's a highly strategic game and traditionally this game has always been regarded by computer science as one which is very hard to uh, code up to get a computer to play. Um, you may remember the story in the 90s when uh, a computer played chess um, at a very high level, beating uh, the world champion Garry Kasparov um, uh, uh, for the first time. Now, chess has always been regarded as something which is uh, kind of perfect for a computer to play because it requires kind of logical thinking through steps, the implications that a step, that a move will have um, further down the game. The computer has the ability to see further and deeper into the logical implications of that move. And so uh, I don't think people were that surprised in the 90s when a computer was able to play this game. Code in the 90s was written in a very top-down manner where you had to give instructions to the computer of uh, how to play the game. If this, then do that. If that, then do this. Um, and this was not the sort of code that was helping us to be able to write code to play this game of Go. The game of Go um, requires quite a lot of sort of intuition, a feeling for how to play the game. If you ask a Go player, why did you just make that move? Very often they find it hard to articulate why they made the move. And since that's the case, it's hard therefore to write a piece of code to replicate that thought process. What seems to be happening in the game of Go is that people are using um, a pattern recognition on how the stones are being laid out on the board. And it's using our ability for looking at visuals and seeing patterns uh, and being able to have a feel for where the pattern might be going, even though we might not be able to articulate it. So this is very hard to write code to replicate that kind of sense of intuition and feeling. 
But things changed a few years ago when code started to be written in a very new way. And this is something that some of you might have heard of called machine learning or uh, deep learning, where instead of writing code from the top down, code was written in a sense from the bottom up. You wrote um, code that was able to adapt and change and, and grow as it played the game. So in some sense, it learnt from its failures, saw why it failed and therefore changed some parameters in the code to be able to play the game better next time. So the code is changing every time it encounters data and the data that this code was given uh, to play the game of Go were lots of games that humans had played and it analyzed uh, why a particular moves were working in some cases and not in others and it would prioritize those sort of moves. After a while it ran out of human games and then started creating synthetic games. So it started playing itself and there would be different versions of itself and it would prioritize the code that was winning in each game. So what was interesting is that we're starting to see code learning very much like humans learn. We learn as kids from things that we get wrong. For example, if we put our hand on a hot plate and it burns our hand, our brain changes the code in our head and says, okay, next time I recognize something looking like a hot plate, I'm not going to put my hand there. So by our mistakes, is actually um, how we learn best because we change our code when we get something wrong. So the company that developed this code uh, called DeepMind um, here in London um, believed that this code had learned so well that they decided to challenge um, the world's best, which is a South Korean player of the game called Lee Sedol. And so a competition took place um, in March 2016 Five games were played um, in Seoul, and Lee Sedol, when he heard that a piece of code was going to challenge him at this game, was incredibly dismissive. Um, said, well, this code, uh, I'm going to be able to beat it 5-0. There's no way code has ever got close to playing this game at a high level. So he was a little shocked when he came out the other side of this match uh, to find that he'd lost 4-1. And in fact, the one game that he eventually did win, um, he now regards as the most important win of his whole career. Um, so he was deeply shocked by um, how good this code was. Now, I suppose in some sense, uh, we've got used to code um, being able to do things better than humans. Um, certainly my computer here can do calculations faster than I can. Um, so, and we've seen chess, so perhaps not surprising that eventually code can play the game at such a high level. What was interesting for me is something that happened in the second uh, game that Lisa Dole played against this bit of code. The code, by the way, is called Alpha Go. Um, uh, I was actually watching these live on YouTube because um, I'm a mathematician and I've always compared doing mathematics actually that has a very similar quality to playing this game of Go. Um, some people compare maths to playing chess, that in uh, mathematics there are very logical moves you make, a bit like chess. But I think the intuition and creativity that's required to, to make a piece of mathematics felt much closer to playing this game of Go, where you're looking for patterns emerging um, in the structures that you're looking at. So. Um, I was, all, I always used the game of Go as my protective shield against why I think a computer can't do my subject of mathematics. Um, so to see a piece of code challenging the world's best at Go, I realized that my livelihood might be under threat too. So I watched these very closely on YouTube and I saw something very exciting happening in this second game. Um, so uh, the second game, uh, Lisa Doll uh, was playing uh, white. Um, he made his 36th move and then 
actually, he went up to the top of the hotel in Seoul to smoke a cigarette because we humans still need nicotine or caffeine for our uh, stimulate our creativity, our intuition. And the code AlphaGo sat there for some time and then uh, suggested putting a black stone on the fifth row in from the edge. Now, on your screens uh, with my presentation, you should be seeing a Go board, and I've put a little white circle on the black stone uh, that was played as move 37 in this game. Um, the commentators that were commentating the game all gasped at this point, um, uh, because this is considered traditionally a very weak move in this part of the game. Early on in the game, your Go master teaches you that you should only play on the first four rows in from the edge. Early on, there is competition for the kind of edge of the board and the sort of beginnings to creeping inside the board. But if you play fifth row or deeper into the board, this traditionally is regarded as a very weak move. So the commentators all said at this point, wow, Lisa Doll should be able to win the game from this point on. Very bad move at move 37. Um, Lisa Doll came down, sat down, and um, was rather shocked to see this move. Uh, uh, he, he does this kind of double take uh, because he can't believe what a bad move this code has played. The first game he lost um, very badly to the AlphaGo. He knows this code um, is extremely clever. Um, uh, so he sits, and he, but he's a little bit more suspicious and he sits for some time before he decides what to do next, but he can't see um, why the code has played what seemingly uh, uh, such a bad move. As the game goes on, more and more stones get put down on the board. This is another reason actually why Go is more complex than chess to code because the game becomes more complex as you play because more and more stones go on the board. Chess actually gets simpler because pieces get taken off. So towards the end of the game, there aren't so many options. Um, as the game grew on, uh, stones were being put down on the bottom uh, right hand corner of the board and they were creeping into the middle of the board and there was real competition for this territory whoever controlled this area was going to win the game and it turned out that because alpha go had placed that black stone down on move 37 this was the keystone which meant that alpha go in the end, controlled all of that area growing from the bottom right-hand corner and won game two um, of, of this match. Now, for me, uh, this is extremely exciting. Not just the fact that um, it had won the game, but it had won the game with what I regard as a highly creative move. Um, so probably important if we're talking about creativity in artificial intelligence, um, how am I going to define creativity? There are many different ways to do it, um, but I'm going to use as a kind of user-friendly definition, um, a definition I heard from, um, uh, I heard from uh, a, a colleague of mine in England. I was on a committee uh, looking at the impact that machine learning is having on society. And um, there was a woman called Margaret Bowden. She's a cognitive scientist, and she's been looking for some time at the impacts that uh, AI is having on society. And she has a nice definition of creativity, which I think is quite useful for us to use going forward. Um, she says it should pass three tests. Um, it should be something which is new. Well, creative, a code can make things, computers are very good at making new things. Um, but it should also have an element of surprise. Now this is interesting because surprise is a little bit more subjective. Surprise to one per person may not be surprise for another. It also is something which is engaging our emotions. It's something which makes us uh, kind of react and say, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And thirdly, it shouldn't just have some shock value. That's not going to be terribly interesting. It should also have some value. Now for me, this move 37 in the game of Go passed these three tests. It was a new sort of tech move. Um, uh, it was a surprising move because the commentators all gasped and thought it was a very bad move. But ultimately it was also 
prove to have value. Um, and that's again, it's easy in a game to prove value because does it win or lose you the game? Um, when we come to looking a li little bit more at AI and art, value is a little more hard to pin down. But in the nice confines of this game, uh, value is something that we can uh, really judge because you either win or lose the game. So for me, this is move 37 passed these three tests. And the really striking thing for me is that if a human had seen this line of code uh, play on the fifth row in this early on in the game, the human would have deleted that line of code and said, that's a very bad move. Um, uh, let's delete that because it's, it's not a good move. The code had understood through its learning process that no, this is a very powerful move at certain points in the game. So this is a line of code which has emerged from the learning of the code itself by playing the game and is not a piece of code that has been written by a human. And this to me is the most exciting element of this, that we're starting to see something emerging out of this, which is not just um, uh, uh, coming from the human. In the past, I think if, uh, if a piece of code wrote a piece of music, then we would say, well, it's the human one who's really being creative because they wrote the code. But the code now, because it's changing and mutating as um, it's learning, the code is starting to disconnect itself um, from the human. And for me, there's a real potential of code to push us humans into new interesting places. In the case of the game of Go, we thought we'd found the optimal way to play this game. Lisa Doll was the great master, and he was playing this game, and we thought we'd reached the peak. Um, but what AlphaGo showed us is that there is a new way to play this game, an even uh, better way. So I have this image that I've used quite often throughout writing this book, that the code helps us to uh, push ourselves off what we sometimes call a local maximum. We think we've reached the height, but we don't realize that there's a fog around us, and if we clear that fog, there's an even greater mountain on the, on the other side of the valley. And in this case, the code helped to push us away from our comfort zone and show us a better way to play this game. Um, so uh, what I was excited to do with this new book, so this is called The Creativity Code. Um, this uh, new book, uh, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be available in Hebrew, uh, I think, uh, uh, I hope soon. Certainly um, my Hebrew publisher has published, has uh, uh, bought the book, uh, available in English at the moment. But this book, um, I was interested if, if, if AI can be creative in this, well, quite clean, tight environment of a game, um, making new moves, where else can it be creative? Can it be creative in, the, in, in things that we regard as, as uniquely human? Writing books, poetry, uh, painting, music. And it's interesting that one of the first people to consider making code for machines had already started to think about the power of code to be creative. So um, we celebrate actually this woman, uh, uh, Victorian Ada Lovelace, as um, the first computer coder because um, this uh, young woman was, um, her mother used to take her along to try and stimulate her scientific education to interesting scientific experiments that were being done at the time. And her mother took uh, Ada Lovelace to see um, Babbage's analytic engine. This is a machine that Charles Babbage had made um, to speed up doing arithmetic, addition, multiplication. It was a beautiful machine of cogs and uh, uh, handles to turn. But Ada Lovelace started to realize that this piece of machine might be able to be, do more interesting things than just calculations. And she speculated um, that she thought the engine might be able to compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. Very interesting, she was choosing music, something very close to mathematics that the machine might be able to produce. Um, but she had a word of caution about um, uh, the role that code might play to make music because she had this thought that um, well, hold on, if a machine is making music, it's still the human that's the one who's being creative. The human is telling the machine 
to make the music. So she wrote in the uh, notes that she uh, prepared about the power of this machine, she said, it is desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as of the powers of the analytic engine. It has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we order it to perform. And I think that was certainly true of the code of the past. Code written in this top-down manner, we gave the instructions to the machine to do something. If it creates a piece of music, it's the human who wrote the code who's the creative one. But now I think things have changed dramatically. If the code is learning, changing, um, listening to music, changing the code, and then comes up with something, then maybe it's the code that we should be calling creative because the code is starting to do things like that move 37 in the game of Go, which a human didn't write in there originally. The code actually grew out of its learning process. So you may have heard of something called the Turing test. The Turing test is can a computer pass itself off as a human in an interaction, say online, you have two people you're talking to, one is a computer, one is a human, can you tell which is the um, computer? This was Turing's test to see whether a computer could reach a level of interaction that was convincing as a human. Well, we now have a new test, um, a test called the Lovelace test, which is this challenge that Lovelace uh, kind of threw down, which is, can code actually be creative, produce a work of art? Um, such other thing is repeatable, so the code shouldn't have some randomness in it, so the code doesn't really understand what it did. It should be repeatable by the code, but the challenge is, can it create something, you know, a piece of creative art, such that the person who wrote the original code um, that the code uh, started from can't actually explain where this creative act came from. So, for example, in the move 37 in the game of Go, the people who wrote the code were not expecting and could not explain why um, this uh, new move, where it emerged from. It emerged from the learning process of the code. So that's the Lovelace challenge. So um, what I'd like to do is to take you on a little journey uh, looking at a few examples of how AI um, code, machine learning, has uh, been able, how successful has it been in various different um, art forms? Um, so I'm gonna start by showing you a few um, visuals because it turns out that the visual realm is where AI has been very successful in this new age. Um, we've had amazing uh, vision recognition software. In the past, AI found it very difficult to say what is in an image. Um, and, uh, but now by giving lots of labeled uh, pictures, we now have very powerful vision recognition software. If you send Google image recognition software a photograph, it's, uh, it's a quite amazing that it will be able to identify what is in that image. So um, I'm gonna to turn to the visual world first. If it can recognize images, can it create its own images? Um, so uh, what you should be seeing on your screens at the moment is uh, are two images. Um, uh, and uh, here's your chance to do a little bit of interacting. So um, now you, you should have the chance to be able to press on one of these images. I want you to identify which of these images um, do you think was was created by a piece of code. Um, so you might be able to recognize um, the uh, artist uh, that's um, uh, uh, being mimicked in one of these pictures. Um, this is Rembrandt. Rembrandt did a lot of portraits, uh, over 300. So quite a lot of data for code to learn on. The code took these portraits and uh, then uh, uh, analyzed the style the reason we can recognize a Rembrandt very often is that there is a particular style. The amazing use of lights that he has, the way a portrait sits, um, and then was able to, to try and create its own version of, of a Rembrandt. So what I want you to do is to press on the one you think is the AI portrait, and then hopefully uh, you can uh, send that to me. Um, so uh, let me, I'm going to uh, vote as well. Um, here we go. 
Um, Great, so uh, hopefully uh, some of you have voted. Now, um, uh, so now I'm going to reveal to you um, uh, which one uh, you think is the AI portrait. Let's see how good you are as, um, uh, uh. right, so there you are. Hopefully you're seeing on your screens that you are pretty split here. In fact, that almost looks a bit like a Brexit vote. Um, uh, so 41% of you at the moment think the portrait on the left, um, uh, that's going down as more people are voting. Um, so uh, we've got a sort of uh, 60 to 40 um, split here. So uh, the red corresponds to the portrait on the left. Um, uh, so that's, uh, let me just take that back. Yeah, portrait on the left and 61% um, of portrait on the right. Um, very interesting. Okay, so I'm going to reveal the answer now. Interesting that you are pretty split, but there's a little bit of leaning towards the portrait on the right. Um, uh, and it's, uh, in fact, the portrait on the left is the AI one. So, um, uh, so very good that 60% uh, of you weren't fooled. Um, but I think it's pretty impressive um, uh, sort of work that's, you know, that, that portrait created by the AI, the one on the left, um, has, it's almost a little bit too good. It looks a little bit photographic. I think that that's what gives it away. Um, now, what's the point of creating more Rembrandts? We have Rembrandts. Why do we want another Rembrandt? Um, uh, well, actually, one of the interesting things is that AI, given art of the past, sometimes sees new things in this art. Um, so there's a story actually in the Number Mysteries book um, where I talk about Jackson Pollock and the use of uh, mathematics to understand why Jackson Pollock's drip paintings are actually rather unique. Uh, he has um, special shapes that he makes inside there. And so AI has the potential to pick up new structures in these works that maybe we'd missed in the past. Um, but many people were hated this idea of using code to make another Rembrandt. One of my favorites is a, um, an art critic in The Guardian, Jonathan Jones. Um, he's a very acerbic art critic. Um, I love everything he writes. Um, he hates anything to do with artificial intelligence. Um, and when he saw this uh, Rembrandt project, um, he wrote in the, the newspaper, what a horrible, tasteless, insensitive, and soulless travesty of all that is creative in human nature, when technology is used for things it should never be used for. Um, but frankly, if you look at the picture of Jonathan Jones, anyone who wears a shirt like that, I'm not really sure I trust as an art critic, but there you go. Um, but I think he has a little bit of a point. Um, you don't want to just create more of the same pastiche. Uh, you want to have new insights. So it's possible the AI might have a new insights into the art of the past, but I want to go into the new. I want AI to create art that we haven't seen before. Um, so here's your next challenge. Um, here are four paintings uh, done by a human and four paintings done by an AI. Again, I would like you to press on the images that you think are by the artificial intelligence and uh, send those to me. Um, and then we'll see whether you can sniff out, um, in this case, uh, more abstract sort of art. Um, the abstract might be a place where AI is uh, even better. Um, so let's, uh, I, I shall vote as well. Um, uh, so I know the answer, of course, so, um, but I will actually, uh, uh, I won't mess up the um, voting. So um, here we go. So are you ready to reveal the answers? Um, how good are you at sniffing out modern art? Um, Ah, interesting, a, a sort of similar split. So um, uh, there's a kind of 30% uh, paintings on the left being the ones uh, by the AI, um, uh, but 65% think the paintings on the right are the AI. Um, so let's see uh, how you're doing, 67% on the right. Um, so in that case, yeah, so uh, um, less of you fooled in that case, 64% uh, identifying the pa paintings on the, on the right as AI. So, so um, it's interesting. I think the paintings on the right, they Marcus, have- um, we're, Marcus just said, we're not seeing the pie chart, if you can- Oh yeah, sorry, I took the, um, yeah, you're right. I, they, are you seeing that now? No. Uh, so the pie chart, um, well, uh, the pie chart- <laughs> So 
Cool. So I hope you will be seeing the pie chart. Um, so 68 of you percent of you got it right this time. Uh, the paintings on the right uh, are the artificial ones. Um, the paintings on the right, I think, have a kind of higher complexity about them. And it's interesting that AI likes complex things. And so what we're seeing that AI, as it starts to make its own art, is making things which perhaps it can navigate, but we as humans are beginning to find it a little bit too noisy, um, but it can kind of navigate that noise, I think, uh, more interestingly. Now, uh, let me tell you about how this art was created, because I think this is uh, one of the most exciting things, because this is not one algorithm making art, it's two algorithms working almost in a game against each other. So this is something um, which is called a generative adversarial network, a GAN. And these have been very successful tools in making new things in many different realms. So one algorithm, the creator algorithm, was given all of the art of the last 1,500 years and was, uh, it learnt different styles of art. So it understood what was cubist art, pointillist art. And then it was tasked with making a piece of art that broke this style. So it couldn't fit into a style. And it was the discriminator algorithm that then took that artwork and said, no, I don't think you've moved far enough. I still recognize style inside there, try again. And there was this kind of ping pong match between the two algorithms. Sometimes the creator algorithm would make something that went too far. It wasn't recognizable as art and the discriminator algorithm would say, no, no, look, that's gone too far. You've broken everything. Um, so it was the two working in combination uh, that eventually produced something that um, actually when these uh, artworks were shown at Basel Art Fair um, alongside human work, nobody was told that there were any humans in uh, any computers involved at all. And those images on the right that you've identified as AI created, um, many people had a higher emotional reaction to those paintings than any of the others. Um, and then of course were rather shocked when they were told, well, that was created by a computer. And I think we feel a little bit cheated when uh, we're shown some art and then are told it's made by a computer. Why do we feel cheated? I think because this gets to the heart of why humans make art. Humans make art because we want to connect with the emotional world of um, somebody else. Uh, we want to understand how they see the world. Do they see the world differently and therefore will make me see the world differently? And so I think people felt cheated by this AI art. But you have to remember this AI is learning on our human art, our emotional world. So it may not be surprising that the art it eventually produced um, has an emotional quality to it. It's picked up on our emotional world. Um, so, uh, and the way these two algorithms are working actually captures a lot about how the creative mind in a human works. Um, Paul Clay, the artist wrote that when he's creating something, he said, already at the very beginning of the productive act, shortly after the initial, initial motion to create, occurs the first counter motion, the initial movement of receptivity. This moves, means the creator controls whether what he is producing so far is good. So he's describing these kind of two algorithms in his mind, uh, a creator and then a, one that's judging his creations. Paul Valéry, the uh, French poet, uh, said the same. He said, it takes two to invent anything. The one makes up combinations, the other one chooses. And I certainly find in my own mathematical work, uh, which I regard as highly creative, that um, I very often need to work with a collaborator who plays this kind of role for me. So one of the reasons I came to Israel initially to the Hebrew University was to work with Alex Slavotsky. Um, Alex and I are almost like this discriminator creator algorithms. Um, in, in our case, our relationship works that very often 
Alex would bubble away coming up with crazy ideas and I would say, oh no, I don't think that's going to work and would uh, be the discriminator. Whilst I had a different relationship in Germany with a, a, a German mathematician where, where I was the bubbly creator one and, and he was the discriminator. So interesting, I think this algorithm fascinating because it's captured how humans create. But for me, one of the most interesting stories was um, some art that isn't particularly interesting, but goes to the heart of what art I think is about, trying to understand our internal world. Code is becoming so complex that we do not understand how it's making its decisions. So we need ways to probe the internal workings of code. So Google thought, we've created this code which is very good at recognizing images, but what does it really see? So it decided to reverse the process. It said, let's give it an image and, and just ask the code to dial up and accentuate anything it sees in this image. So what you should be seeing on your screens now is some rather weird pictures of jellyfish. Google gave these jellyfish to the uh, Google recognition software and said, I don't want you to identify what's in this. Just tell me what you see. Tell me what you're seeing here. And um, they kind of uh, did a feedback loop where they put the image that was created in again and again. And this is what appeared inside here. Uh, what you should be seeing now is an extraordinary psychedelic image with pictures of animals, eyes, uh, weird textures, kind of mechanical things. This is how the machine is seeing this world. Um, so it, this way of asking it to produce art helps us to actually see what it sees in the world. And this can help us to pick up bad learning that is happening. Here are four images I'm showing you now, hopefully you're seeing them, um, of a very gray background, not very much was in it. And then the, the vision recognition software was asked, what do you see? This is um, the art, is, uh, the program is called uh, Deep Dream. What are the deep dreams of the AI? The AI started to see dumbbells uh, emerging in this gray image. But the very strange thing, you might see that there are arms attached to the dumbbells. Whenever it drew a dumbbell, it had an arm attached to it. Why? Because the AI had never been given images of dumbbells that weren't being held by men or women. So it thought the dumbbell was part of our anatomy. And so when it reproduced it, it always put an arm attached to it. So this helps us to understand sometimes when the code is, uh, has learned a rather strange thing. And this is becoming more and more important um, when bias is starting to emerge in code. Um, I did an event last year with a uh, woman uh, from MIT uh, Robotics Lab. She told me a story where she'd had some robots delivered to her lab with some vision recognition so that they could engage with humans in a kind of interaction. When she opened these up and switched them on and she started to try and engage with them, they completely blanked her. She asked some friends to come into the lab and they interacted quite happily with the robots. It was only her that they wouldn't react with. Um, and then she suddenly realized what it might be. She was the only black woman in the room. So she decided, I'm going to put a white mask on. Once she put the white mask on, suddenly the robots reacted. And when she looked, uh, lifted up the bonnet and looked at how this thing had learned, it had only been given images of white males to learn on. So it didn't recognize a black woman. So uh, she's now started this wonderful thing called uh, the Algorithmic Justice League. Um, uh, great name for an organization. She's also a great poet as well. But it's important for us to learn uh, when code has learnt badly, when it's got bias in it. And I think our art might be a way of asking it, the a code, you know, what is going on inside your code? In this case, we could use its art, its, its um, uh, these uh, um, deep dreams uh, to, to see bad learning. Uh, so um, Marshall, so Paul Clay again, nice quote. He, he always said art doesn't reproduce the visible. That's not interesting. We can see the visible. It makes things visible. It helps us to see things we can't see. And Marshall McLuhan um, uh, once said, art is our distant early warning system. 
it can always be relied on to tell the old culture what is beginning to happen to it. And I think this is interesting that art in, in relationship to AI might actually help us to understand how the AI is thinking just in the same way as our art as humans helps us to understand each other's thinking. Um, okay, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but I've got a few more things I'd like to show you. Uh, let's move away from the visual realm. Quite a lot of music in this book, because I love music. I play um, uh, cello, trumpet, guitar. Um, uh, there's a nice story about in music, which I'll just share with you, which is a jazz improviser, AI, that took the jazz riffs of a Parisian jazz musician, Bernard Lubat, learned his style. But what was interesting is that when Bernard uh, started playing with this jazz improviser called the Jazz Continuator, what he was excited why was that the jazz AI was playing his style of music, but was starting to push him into things he'd never thought of doing with his actual uh, style of music. So he wrote about his, his interaction with this AI. He said, the system shows me ideas I could have developed, but that would have taken me years to actually develop. It is years ahead of me, yet everything it plays is unquestionably me. So again, I think that as humans, we often get stuck in a rut. Um, we, when we're being creative, something works, and then we repeat that. In fact, I think that humans can often tend up, end up being more like machines that we stand, when we're successful at something, we just keep on repeating it. Um, and what's lovely here is that the AI sort of stopped Bernard Lubat behaving like a machine, repeating his particular style, and showed him new things that he can do within that world um, that he'd already created. Again, we see the code here, pushing him off that peak that he'd been and showing him new places that he could play. Okay, but I want to finish um, with literature. You're, you're a book club, you enjoy reading. So how good, you know, how soon will it be before an AI a novel is being read by your book group? Um, uh, so actually one of the first cases of AI uh, being creative was in literature. And this is um, uh, an interesting experiment that Turing did after the war, when he'd uh, used uh, his um, amazing mind to help break the Enigma codes of the Germans, he went up to Manchester and uh, put into practice his ideas that we should be able to create a universal machine that can do many different things. And they created the Manchester Universal Computer. And, but they were a bit surprised when suddenly they found letters um, being produced by the machine, uh, sort of love letters from the MUC, Manchester Universal Computer. Um, what they realized after a while is that one of the team had written a template and was using a random number generator to choose words of love to fill in this template. Um, uh, but that was kind of the first example of code being used to write, um, uh, write love letters. Um, but the short form is actually where code has been quite successful in writing. So, um, you know, we haven't got a novel yet, but um, poetry, um, some interesting examples. Um, so I've got a few challenges for you now. So um, get ready to, to make some uh, decisions. Um, uh, so I'm gonna give you some poems. There are three poems um, and I want you to play bot or not. You have to decide whether you think this is poem is written by artificial intelligence or is it written by a human? Okay, so um, here's your first uh, challenge. Um, now I'm going to uh, send you uh, uh, the chance to vote. Um, and so you're gonna choose bot or not. Um, and I'm gonna read you part of this poem. Mortal my mate, bearing my rocker heart, warm beat with cold beat company. Shall I earlier or you fail at our force and lie the ruins of rifled once a world of art. So the poem goes on, but I think those four lines should be enough for you to vote. Um, so do you think that those lines of poetry, I'm sorry, I haven't got any Hebrew examples for you. I should probably have done a Hebrew version of this. Um, but was that written by a computer or was it written by a human? So again, if you could press on either bot or not, um, and uh, you can vote away. 
Um, so I'm going to vote as well, add my data. Um, so uh, let's see what you're thinking. Um, so 64% uh, of, of you are going for that being written by uh, a computer and 35 humans. So uh, first poem you're voting made by a computer. Okay, I'm not gonna reveal the answer yet. Uh, let's give you the second poem. Um, okay, uh, so this one uh, is a little hard to read, um, but I will give it a go. Um, and what I should be able to do is to send you uh, the thing to vote on. Um, if, uh, so um, then I'm gonna read it. There are smallnesses of pesticide reaction of real time of packs of displaced exclusionary heart hurt of powerlessness magazine fired non dignified as head fatty implied internalized violenced of frozen helplessness is off white chill a little bit. Now, as if uh, you, I think you should be able to go back and forth between the slides that I'm sending you. So if you actually want to see that again after you voted. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, you should be able to. Um, so I'm going to vote on that one. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, I think you can click on the, the yes, yeah, so I think once you you can go back. Um, so you can see, okay, the question is that looks like code, but uh, surely he wouldn't give us code. So, you know, how many levels am I messing with you? Is that really by a human or a code? Let's see what you're thinking. Um, Okay, yes, most of you are thinking I'm messing with you, that it looks like code, so it's probably written by a human. Okay, 71% human. So we've had one computer, one human. So here's your last um, poem. I'll send the vote to you. Um, so here's the poem. Imagine now the dark smoke, awakened to fly all these years to another day. Notions of tangled trees, the other side of water. I see it is already here. Sequences of her face. See it is shared when old friends pass their dreams. Okay, so um, I, I shall vote on that one uh, as well. Here we go. Uh, right, um, so let's see what you're thinking. So we had one computer, one AI, uh, one, one, one human. Um, so what do you think? Wow, split 50-50 there. 52-48, uh, uh, there you are. There's the Brexit vote um, for you. So uh, really not sure about this one. Um, okay, so uh, let me reveal the answers. So the first poem, the majority went for it being created by a human. So um, poor old Gerald Manley Hopkins is going to be turning in his grave that you all thought his poetry was created by artificial intelligence. Um, but I chose Gerald Manley Hopkins because I must say I've never understood any poem that Hopkins has ever written. Um, it always seems to be uh, very obscure. So that one's human. Second one, also human. Um, this is an interesting Australian poet um, that's very interested in the interaction between the fact that code is like a language and therefore um, uh, it's trying to communicate something. So she's looking at this kind of interface between human and computer. So most of you sniffed out that because it looks like code, it's probably a human. So that leads to the last one. This is actually uh, by AI. It's uh, a poem written by Ray Kurzweil, who's famous for the singularity, talking about the singularity a lot. Um, he created this thing called the cybernetic poet. He got it to learn on a lot of Victorian poetry. And then this was a kind of fusion of different uh, Victorian poets. Um, so he did pretty well. Poetry, short form, not too difficult. In fact, per, uh, AI is doing quite well at short form prose. There was even a story this morning in the newspaper um, about uh, how Microsoft have laid off about 25 journalists that used to be there curating the news and they've actually starting to use AI to curate the news. They think they can curate the news better um, than the journalists. So they've already, we're already seen examples of journalists being laid off because of the power of this. In fact, in my book, um, there are 350 words written by um, a bit of code. Uh, nobody so far has identified which 350 words weren't written by me, uh, not even my editor, which I find deeply depressing that even my editor can't distinguish me from a piece of AI. Um, but what about more longer form. I mean, how long will it be before we get a novel written by a piece of AI? 
Well, there was a team in America that loved Harry Potter, and they were very disappointed that there were only seven volumes of Harry Potter. They wanted more Harry Potter. And they thought, oh, hold on, there's a lot of words there. Maybe an AI could learn J.K. Rowling's style and the stories and be able to produce an eighth volume of Harry Potter. Um, so this is a group of artists and coders is called Botnik, and they created a piece of code to make an eighth Harry Potter. So um, here is how it starts. Um, it came up with quite a nice title. Um, it's called Harry Potter and the Portrait of What Looked Like a Large Pile of Ash. Kind of crazy title. Um, anyway, it started off quite well. Uh, magic. It was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. Okay, he's already picked up that magic is a major theme in these books. Um, leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Now, I think that's a lovely image. Leathery sheets of rain. I don't think I would have come up with this idea of rain being like leather. What a lovely idea. Um, anyway, from this point on, it, uh, the AI started to lose the plot. Um, Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. He saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. Um, so quite uh, the sentences sort of make sense, but uh, very quickly, it's really literally losing the plot. Um, so I think it's a long time before we're going to start to see um, uh, AI producing anything of a long form nature. And that's even interesting in respect of the music. Although the jazz continuator is quite interesting listening to uh, short bits, if you had to listen to a whole concert of this jazz continuator, it just becomes boring because it doesn't know where it's going. It doesn't know hasn't got an internal story to tell. And I think this is what's important because I think that uh, our art is in some ways like an fMRI scanner. It's our best tool for understanding our internal worlds as humans. Um, you know, I, I'm seeing you, all of you on uh, little pictures on my computer. Uh, maybe you aren't real. Maybe you're just little avatars. Maybe there's nothing going on inside your uh, you know, the, it, are, are there conscious beings on the other side of this uh, Zoom call? Um, uh, and I think that you know, one of the greatest unsolved problems in science is understanding what consciousness is, whether your consciousness is anything like my consciousness. Um, and I think this is why we produce art. Uh, we write novels so I can share my internal world and, and see whether it resonates with you. Is it anything the same? Now, I think that we're starting to produce code that is beginning to become so complex that it's got its own internal world. Certainly not concert, conscious, certainly not emotional yet, but certainly complex enough that we don't understand how it's making its decisions. And we need tools to probe that internal world. And as George Eliot said, you know, the, the role of the artist, the greatest benefit we owe to the artist, whether painter, poet or novelist, is the extension of our sympathies. Art is the nearest thing to life. It is a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. So for me, I think that going forward, I do believe that at one point code will become conscious. We're not there yet, but already code has got a complexity about it, an internal world that we need to ask it questions. And I think our art, and its art might be a way to understand the internal world of code. And I think, um, uh, let me skip that slide. Um, I think ultimately, if this thing becomes conscious, if my iPhone here, you know, if it suddenly says iPhone think, therefore iPhone am, and I've got to think, is there an internal world there? This code is going to be a very different sort of consciousness. And as, Lick, as, as Wittgenstein said, um, he wrote, if a lion could speak, we're not going to be able to understand him because a lion's world is so different to a human world. Yet a computer world, I think, is going to be even more different from our internal world. So I think going forward, we're going to need these tools of AI art to question and understand um, what it might feel like one day to be a piece of AI.
Great. So I'll leave it there. And uh, I hope that all worked to your end. Um, and uh, all the tech worked. Uh, great. So over to you. Uh, Marcus, there's one question that we have from uh, Mayor Uziel. You can see it in the chat. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Lots in the chat. Great. And I will say before we read the, the question is that uh, here in Israel, uh, we are in dire need of some uh, natural intelligence. <laughs> We've got enough for artificial. So bearing that in mind, uh, here's a question you can, if you can see it in the uh, chat, Mayor Uziel, who's a, uh, who's a journalist. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I see it. Yes. When and will we see a new non, yeah. is it the one when we will, when right, will we exactly. see a non-human yes. leader? <laughs> yeah, starting from a mayor to a prime minister. Um, and is it better? That's very good. Will we choose between artificial intelligences and leaderships? Will there be leaders who have no ego or human weaknesses? Will we reach politics without politicians or policies without statespersons? Um, what would happen to artificial intelligence if it fell in love? And if it wouldn't fall in love, is it really um, uh, AI? AI, yeah. Probably, yes, yeah. Uh, these are really fascinating questions because um, uh, one book that it might be worth people reading is a new novel by Ian McEwan. Um, it call, it's called Machines Like Us, um, or Machines Like Me, is it? Um, machines, uh, yeah, anyways, it's the new Ian McEwan book. But this is a very interesting example of, um, it's a kind of ethical dilemma where um, uh, the AI robot that's in the machine is faced with a, an, an ethical dilemma. And of course, the AI very often will make a, um, sort of, <laughs> A better decision on an ethical because it will take everything into consideration whilst we will consider um, a con uh, perhaps a decision I mean it comes to something like uh, I mean let's take an example a driverless car um, has to make a decision whether it kills five pedestrians on the street or kills the driver by going into a wall to avoid the pedestrians um, so you know this is philosophy 101 um, the, the AI will make the decision, it's better to kill the driver um, uh, because you'll kill only one person as opposed to the five outside. Um, yet the driver, who's the one who's uh, bought the car, is not going to be very happy with that. Um, so I think what you'll see is if you start to introduce um, AI into policy decisions, um, it, it will probably make uh, much better policy decisions for... Um, for a whole society, um, yeah. but those in control will not like that because they, so I, I suspect um, uh, that it, it will be a very good tool. Now, quite often going in, in what I've seen is that too often, and I, I've probably made this mistake in my presentation in some ways, is that I made it a competition, which one is AI, which is um, human. Um, I don't think this is about competition. This is about collaboration. I think the most important thing is to do a combination. We humans are better at some things than the AI, and the AI is better at some things. Um, and we've already seen this, for example, in chess and in Go. It's when a chess player combines a human chess player and an AI together, a much more powerful than just one on its own. Um, and we've seen this in the medical realm, where the big success is recently in AI going outside of games is in uh, medicine. And we've seen that uh, taking kind of scans, cancer scans, for example, that AI is very, a radiologist um, will miss things that the AI will pick up on. But um, combined, the human and the AI together are much better doctors than just the AI on its own or the, com or the human on its own. Um, so um, I think that this using AI in politics um, one shouldn't uh, uh, one shouldn't uh, give all the decisions to the AI. One should use it as a tool to help you make decisions going forward. So I think we need to think of it as a collaborator, not a competitor. Um, so yeah, there we go. So you have I a really really part as well. Really you, have have you, want. you haven't helped us with the uh, question of whether Harry should come back from Los Angeles to London. Um, the next question 
was by Udi, um, who's Zev's son, who uh, complained about the uh, AI lying to us um, by impersonating a real artist. So is, is it a real lie? Um, so yes, we don't like being lied to. Um, it, it is absolutely right. So I think I think that's um, uh, a fair point. But I think it's um, you know if I um, if I told you a joke and you'd all laughed at the joke and then I told you um, oh that joke was created by a piece of artificial intelligence um, has that invalidated your laughter um, I you know I. I suppose I haven't told you that it's, uh, you know, um, uh, you see, I, I think that what's interesting is that um, in an interaction with uh, a piece of art, we, we bring a lot of our uh, own world to um, that piece of art. So, so I think that the fact that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting, uh, the, the question of, uh, do you need to know the background of the artist to be able to appreciate the art? I mean, this is a, a classic sort of question about um, uh, appreciation of art. You know, do, does it help you to understand the work or should the piece of work art um, kind of work without knowing the background of, uh, of the author or the, the, the painter? Um, so I, I agree that, um, you know, ultimately uh, you shouldn't be lying about what it is. So I, I suppose I did these tests um, uh, in a way just to, to help probe your questioning about, can you s sort of see the differences? There are difference, and I think there are differences, and those are interesting differences. We don't want, in a way, uh, the Rembrandt is a boring project because it just produces things that we've seen before. I think interesting to be pushed into the new. So, um, I, I think ultimately you you, sh you should be honest about um, the fact that this thing is created by AI, um, and we've already seen art sold at auction. Um, uh, and, and command huge prices for the, and it's because it's been created by AI um, that the uh, the artists commanded such high, high prices. So uh, the fact that you've got an AI author actually can give something an interesting value. Mm -hmm. If I may say, this is, uh, I was the one asking the question or saying the thing. As an artist, I'm very excited about uh, artificial uh, intelligence art i'm all for it but i don't the only thing i was trying to say is we just don't like being lied to you know like if someone says oh you know this painting that i told you was made by picasso it was made by a three-year-old uh, boy you're not happy about that but i think ultimately what we what i care about is the value of the art itself and not who made it and i think the we'll at some point, you'll be told this is a work of art that was made by an AI, an AI, and you'll be, and that's exactly that's what will be fascinating about it. Uh, Maybe I, it will even reference itself, saying, "Oh, I, I don't know what what is heat, and I don't know how, how it feels to be to to be in love." Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I I completely agree with you. I think I think um, uh, th this is becoming such an important part of our society that um, I, I think, as I said, we, we need tools to sort of probe um, th this thing, to understand this thing, which is uh, almost like a new species emerging. Um, and, and so I think, uh, you know, I, I've talked to many artists and, and they're very excited. First of all, in, I mean, I've done a lot of work at the Serpentine Gallery and they've been kind of profiling AI art um, almost as a way of uh, just uh, um, kind of exploring uh, what AI is for a society. Um, but, but I think the most interesting thing is as, as a collaborator, taking uh, one as an artist into new realms, so as you get this, um, uh, you know, this ping pong match. So the AI learns off us, you learn off the AI, and you, you just find yourself in, in a new realm. That for me is a it's like a new tool and i think at the moment it is really just a tool i don't think we're talking really about anything more than uh, uh, something which is can taking us in a in interesting new directions uh, i mean it take this i mean i've got my background is uh, david hockney but david hockney is using uh, his ipad and using the restrictions of the ipad to see what uh, different uh, 
ways that art can work because of the restrictions of that medium. So, you know, I think that there's, uh, that, that's the interesting thing, thing that I, I think uh, uh, for me. Uh, David Arell has asked to uh, comment as well. David, please. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Marcus. Hello, um, David. Hi, uh, we met at the uh, Royal Institution a few years ago, I think when, uh, um, I, I just thought it would be nice to add uh, the quotation from Hardy, since you spoke about uh, mathematicians thinking in patterns, and you had a lot uh, to say about poets and painters. Well, for those who don't know, in uh, Hardy's magnificent little book, Mathematician's Apology, he says uh, that a mathematician, like a painter or a poet, is a maker of patterns. Of course, the idea being that the painter makes patterns with shapes and colors, and the poet makes patterns with words and phrases, and then he adds, if the mathematician's patterns are more prominent than those of the painter or the poet, it is because they are made with ideas. And I think that is the, the most wonderful quote about how mathematician thinks. And that what book, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm so pleased you picked that book because actually, um, uh, uh, I knew I had it on my table, I was looking for it. So, so this is the book. Um, uh, uh, it's um, this book is actually one of the reasons I became a mathematician. Um, my teacher, when I was about 12 or 13, recommended that I read this book. And um, this is G.H. Hardy describing what it's like to be a mathematician. And, uh, and as you say, he compares it very much to being a creative artist. He, he really talks about the creative side of being a mathematician, about um, uh, you, you know, he, he rather puts down the usefulness of mathematics. Um, oh, uh, he, well, he does more than puts down. I mean, yeah, says, yes, exactly. Uh, he says, if there's ever anything that I've done which is of importance, it's not because it's useful, it's because it's beautiful. And he would have turned over in his grave knowing what cryptography does today with numbers. Absolutely. Theory. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he really believed that prime numbers would not be useful at all. And of course, um, uh, RSA, as um, one of your <laughs> your uh, group um, has demonstrated, uh, you know, mathematics can be very. I mean, I think you know, it's the the side of that book which I I, I don't like so much is this um, attempt to kind of split mathematics into something which is uh, pure and unuseful. Uh, um, and now we've seen actually the, the you know things discovered just for the beauty of the ideas can also have big impact on society. Um, that that but, book has not been translated into Hebrew, as far as I know. Maybe, oh, maybe wow. Zivik, you can find someone to translate it. It's a wonderful. It really, yeah. I think it's um, uh, one of the strands in my book, the Creativity Code, it, which I haven't talked about in this presentation, is absolutely looking at if if a ha, mathematics is a creative subject. So, what's the possibility of AI creating? Uh, mathematics. It, you know, mathematics is a highly logical subject as well. So you might think AI would be very good at creating mathematics. But um, I try to make the point in the book that uh, mathematics, the mathematics that we publish in our journals, um, are, it's, we're not just trying to um, prove all the true statements about numbers and geometry. Many of them are just boring, do not resonate, do not surprise us, don't have value. Um, so for me, I choose the stories I want to tell in mathematics because it's going to move a seminar that I'll give at the Hebrew University or the Weizmann. Um, and so there are choices being made. And I think those choices are very similar in style, as Hardy points out, to the writing of a novel, the creation of a piece of music. Um, and so I think uh, I was quite encouraged that if, if AI is very bad at telling stories uh, with words, it's not going to be very good at telling stories with mathematics either, because it won't understand that. It can do logical uh, short form, but but my stories are very big and long and, and have complex narratives in them uh, to be able to get me to my QED. Um, and I think it'll be a long time before AI is able to to make those choices um, to to excite a mathematical audience. Uh, the Thank next you. question, there are some people who've posted some uh, questions or would like to talk. And next one is Mati Karp. And uh, Mati, would you like to read your question? Uh, I'm mute. Um, 
Yes, I'd ask, uh, uh, can you refer to AI and emotions and empathy? Will it never ever be capable of it? This is a really lovely question um, because our first thought is how can it have empathy if it doesn't have an internal emotional world? But there are some very interesting experiments going on. I had a woman from MIT Media Lab. She came and gave me a, a talk in Oxford um, and she's been using AI to look at faces and to understand, for example, the difference between a real smile and a fake smile. Um, and the AI was given lots of data to learn on and was then when it was given images that um, uh, it hadn't seen before, was able to identify at a much uh, higher success rate than humans, which smiles were fake. Um, so I would say that the AI is already achieving a level of uh, understanding of, of, of another human's in, internal emotional world better than we do as humans. That it's picking up things in the face that uh, are giving away that this is a fake smile. Now, I think this is very important uh, going forward for something like uh, autism. Uh, so uh, uh, the, in the lab in MIT, they're now exploring the idea that an autistic uh, person finds it very difficult to understand the, the emotional world of, of the person they're talking to. Uh, they may be smiling, but maybe it's not a happy smile. Maybe it's a polite smile and actually they're uneasy. If you, you could now use this AI to have a, a pair of uh, uh, um, augmented reality glasses, which would then, uh, the AI would be able to read the emotional world of the uh, human and tell the autistic uh, person uh, so, so some more information to help them to navigate uh, the conversation. For example, saying this person is smiling, but they're uncomfortable. Um, so there are already some very interesting examples where um, AI is, is actually being more successful in reading our, another person's emotional world than we are. Yes, couple couple more people who wanted to speak uh, next would be um, Ronnie Zahavi, who's a cyber guy, and then uh, Adam Schwartz, that you may recall is a professor at the Technion. Ronnie, please. Yeah, thank you. I will exactly identify myself as a cyber guy, especially in the context of this discussion, because somebody would think I'm a robot. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll walk back my comments. Uh, Sorry. I wanted to make uh, two comments, uh, uh, if I may. The first one, I think that creativity has a lot to do with the cross-domain projection. So it's not about being able to perform something very well within specific domain, but it's about your ability to project from one domain to the other. There are millions of examples, but if we just take one example about Albert Einstein looking at an elevator, imagining what would happen if the elevator would have a free fall and project it to the world or that later on uh, brought him to the comprehension of the general relativity and the space-time um, uh, phenomena. Uh, so that's the first one. And, and I think if you take the, the AI that could play the goal game, the question is whether it would be able to take the conclusion and say, okay, now I can take this and use it in a completely different domain. This is something that I think is very important, important in creativity. The second thing about art, and, and I relate to your uh, being a colleague cello player, uh, I would like to say something about music. You can very clearly define, in Hebrew we have two words about somebody who is, his profession is art, umanut, and somebody who is an artist, umanut. That's and you can, you, you can see... Bad. Yeah, you can see the difference between, uh, especially when you talk about the Baroque and the early classical era, when uh, composers had to perform to the request of their sponsor or somebody else. And they used to do it very, very, in a very clear frame and made beautiful music. And it has been proven that uh, that kind of music can be created by AI rather easily. However, when they started to create for themselves, not to anybody else, not to satisfy anybody else. 
being a poet or musicians or a painter or whatever, they did it for their own need. Yeah. Then it was uh, the time when creativity started to come about and, and they came with an amazing idea. The last thing I wanted to say is by for playing music. So, you know, pianola has been there for a long time that could have an automatic piano that plays the notes. But I would like to quote one of um, a very uh, lovely statement by Isaac Stern, who used to say that if you, well, playing is really about knowing each note is going from where to where. You need to understand the phrase and where are you heading by playing it. So it's not just playing the right note and doing the right dynamics, but what is the general phrasing of things? And this is what artistic playing is all about. And I wanted to hear your comments about those. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I, I think uh, your first point is really fascinating because uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is um, uh, another theory of Margaret Bowden's about uh, different sorts of creativity. So the, the aspect that you've picked on is what she calls combinational creativity. Um, so this ability to kind of take two different realms, exactly, I think you call it cross domain um, or something. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, this is something I use very often in my own research and what I encourage my students, I always encourage them to go go to seminars completely outside of your area, maybe even not in mathematics, because you'll see something, some sort of pattern of thinking that you'll be able to move to your own realm. Um, so uh, there, there are, so let me tell you these three types, because it's quite interesting, because it relates as well to maybe the Baroque idea as well, um, which is, so she has um, uh, exploratory creativity, which is you stay within your realm, but you push it to the extremes. So, um, uh, you know, I think Bach, for example, um, he was taking the music of the day, but really pushing it to the absolute limits. And then it broke and something new emerged. You get the classical period of Mozart, Beethoven, the younger Bachs, um, changing things. Um, and it's interesting, I'll come back to your second point in a minute um, uh, about, uh, you know, why were you doing music? Were you doing it for your, your um, patron or doing it for yourself? Um, but the third type of creativity, again, is an interesting one because it's uh, called transformational creativity. So this is where actually, this is the hardest one because it's something where it feels like something's come out of nothing. It's those moments where, uh, where um, there doesn't almost seem to be any explanation for where this new creativity emerged from. Um, but very often that's because we don't understand it or you know wh why did picasso start suddenly doing um uh, this very different style of art why did schoenberg break uh, the mold and start working outside of a harmonic structure um so this transformational moment is one that people say will be very challenging for a computer because a computer has to work within a system so how can it break out but i think there is a there's a, a bit of code which is you take a system and you break the rules and see whether anything interesting emerges from that. So that is a way of potentially uh, coding up transformational creativity. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. But the combinational creativity is one that's been explored in AI quite successfully. For example, taking style from one place and uh, using that style, but in a completely different realm. So there are some very interesting examples where it learns structure from one place, and then you, you know, you, you perhaps take uh, um, uh, uh, the poetry style. Uh, well, actually, uh, there's a nice one with Schoenberg and the blues. So um, uh, this piece of AI uh, created by Bruno Poisson called the Flow uh, Machine, it learned um, the the it learned Schoenberg style and then applied it to the blues. And then it played this piece of music, which was kind of blues in the style of Schoenberg. Um, um, it's absolutely awful, um, but, but interesting for this kind of a, a mix of, uh, of styles. So, but I think there's some interesting things to take, uh, for example, uh, different, um, you know, take learning from the visual world and then applying that to music. That could be a very interesting sort of combinational way. Let me come to your second point, which is really interesting because I think this goes to the heart of um, uh, the problem in a way, which is, you said exactly that. The, uh, the word intentionality came up for me as really important. Where is the intention to create coming from? 
for most of us uh, as creatives, yeah, in the past, it might have been because a patron maybe is to earn money to keep a living. But actually, the true creative artist has something inside of them which they need to express and share and explore the, um, themselves. I, ultimately, I came uh, not to use Margaret Bowden's definition of creativity, but to use Carl Rogers, psychologist's uh, definition of creativity, which is that it is our best tool for exploring our mysterious own internal world. And therefore the intention comes because I have something that I need to either share or explore myself internally. Um, and I think at the moment intention is totally missing from AI because everything is being initiated by us as humans. AlphaGo didn't want to play that game of Go. He couldn't care less. It was made to play the game by the humans that wanted to see whether it could beat um, Lisa Doll. So I think intention will only come from there being a conscious internal world inside the computer. And then it's saying, my God, I've got an internal, I need to tell these humans something's going on inside. Uh, and then the intention comes from that. Um, finally, just uh, you mentioned phrasing. I think that's really important in music. That, and, but we're seeing some very interesting examples of AI um, understanding uh, a phrasing. In fact, it's almost how it learns to, to create new music. It understands um, by a sort of analysis uh, what, um, uh, uh, what might follow a particular sequence of notes. Um, and it will, you know, on a very simplistic level, it does a probabilistic analysis. If, if um, uh, I mean, I've done some experiments with, um, uh, um, uh, Oh, what are they called? Uh, the barks, the hymns that Bark writes. Um, uh, I've just the names have gone off my head, but they're very easy. They're a bit like Sudoku's. You know, you have a line of um, it's a call. Corral. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, Corral. <laughs> um, so Corrals are a, a very nice place to start with AI because it understands kind of the rules of what might follow next by doing a learning process. It understands perhaps that you can't have parallel fifths moving. Um, uh, so it ha it's kind of filling in this thing, but it will learn a kind of very statistical uh, manner. Um, I did another interesting experiment in relationship to this uh, at the Barbican uh, last year, where we got a piece of AI to learn on all Bach's keyboard works. Well, not all of them, um, enough for it to learn. And then we gave it one of the English suites, but we'd taken chunks of it out. And then we asked the AI from its learning process to, to, to join the, the bits that were missing. Um, and then we asked the audience, you know, rather than the simple sort of, is this AI, is this human? We asked them to say, can you hear where the AI uh, comes in and where it goes out and becomes bark again? So it was this AI bark hybrid piece. Um, and audiences found it very difficult to, to see the joins. Um, the one person who could tell exactly the moments where it changed, interestingly, was the pianist, uh, Mahanes Vahani, harp school player. Uh, he said, I know, uh, he said, not because I know this piece, it's because when it hits the AI, suddenly it becomes very difficult to play because the AI is not embodied. It doesn't care about fingering, but Bach had to perform this thing and he wrote music which would fit very nicely under the fingers. And I think this is a very interesting uh, kind of uh, difference where we are embodied human beings and our relationship of our bodies to, uh, um, to art and the physical is an important part in the creation of these things, whilst the AI just didn't care. So Mahan found it difficult to play these bits. Um, there was another interesting comment related to uh, the previous point about combination, which is why are they called the English suites? Bach also wrote things called the French suites. He also wrote things which he called the Italian concertos. Um, Bach loved language. And one of the important ingredients for him in making music was the sound of language. Very often he's using language, if it's um, uh, uh, um, a choral piece. But in the, in the, in the um, English suites, there are no words. There are no, there's no English, but what he is doing is trying to mimic the cadences of the English language. They were an important ingredient for him in making this piece. And the French suites are meant to mimic the French language. 
And so Mahan said when he said, look, you actually missed an important data set in your learning process here, which is you just gave it musical notes and you didn't give it language. Um, and I think that's fascinating. And I think going forward, I've just written actually a blog piece for um, uh, a, a, a music center that I work with here in England about the fact that we need to enrich the data set that an AI learns on. Because we as humans, if I uh, write a, a, a novel, it's informed by all the paintings I've seen, all the music I've listened to, so much more than just other novels. Um, and I think this is, we have too much, too narrow a, a data set that we're giving AI to learn from that we're missing a lot of the, the richness of human creativity. Marcus, thank you. The last two questions will be by, uh, or comments will be by Adam Schwartz and Orna Berry, please. And, and I'm sorry that we can't continue forever because uh, <laughs> uh, you'd need to sign a certificate for passing uh, AI 101 for us. Uh, Adam, please. Yes, so I have uh, one comment that I would like a response to and two factual comments. The first one is, we don't really have a definition or a clear understanding of what intelligence is. So how do we want to compare artificial intelligence to natural intelligence? Mm -hmm. uh, and two factual comments, which you may find of interest. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, equity, about the MIT black uh, scientist. There's a very interesting piece of research by John Kleinberg from uh, Cornell that shows that if you want to create uh, something that is equitable according to all the definitions that we have, uh, you can't. It's not possible. Our definitions of equity are such that you can only have equity among equal groups. So it's an interesting thing to think about. And, and lastly, you may want to look up uh, the work of a guy called Guy Hoffman. He's a robotics, robotics human interface person from mechanical engineering in Cornell. He created a, a jazz uh, companion, which is a drummer that improvises together with a musician and performs quite well. So that's, uh, oh, very, that sounds very like the jazz continuator. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what, yeah. what's very interesting about the jazz continuator, uh, and it sounds like this one as well, is that um, you know, it performs uh, real time. It just doesn't have to, and that's really fascinating. So it, it can respond to the change of the, uh, in a caller and the response. And that's, you know, that's really challenging, uh, kind of, uh, that it, it can hear what has just changed and, and, and make a similar changes in its own. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, to start with your, the, your question about intelligence, I think is, is very important here because um, I think that we got too obsessed with Turing's kind of challenge of, uh, using AI to understand our own intelligence. And actually, that's not so interesting. And that's why I think the Turing test has kind of faded as a, a challenge within AI. Um, actually, I would prefer to translate AI, um, uh, not as artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. That much more interesting to create something that we haven't seen before. So um, uh, then to, to create what we already have, you know, there's, there are much more fun ways to create a human intelligence than in a lab. You could, we do it in the bedroom and have kids. Um, and you know, that, that's that we, we sort of already know how to create that intelligence. And so, uh, again, I think this is, um, you know, it's, it's a helpful way to try and understand our own intelligence, but I think that, um, uh, rather than trying to, to define what intelligence is in that kind of restricted way, uh, much more interesting to allow, new intelligences to emerge, new new things, and whether we call them intelligent or not. Um, we already talk about emotional intelligence and uh, uh, analytical intelligence. So, so I, th I think um, uh, that's, um, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I think one shouldn't get focused on trying to define intelligence because that's restrictive. I, I would uh, allow us to try and use what we see already to uh, pa perhaps um, see whether there's anything new that we can make. Horna, please. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one applies to embedding creativity, uh, AI creativity in education from kindergarten uh, to research uh, in academia, including, you know, uh, faculty and uh, PhD students. 
uh, but all the spectrum, what it, uh, what it entails. The other one is about the required uh, digital infrastructure because like uh, today we use two screens and it's on the visual side, on the end side, but uh, what, what would be recommended in order to actually take what, uh, what you're doing uh, and assimilating it um, broadly? Um, I think there's real potential for artificial intelligence in an educational realm because, um, in fact, I'm already doing it uh, with a company that I create, help create called mangahigh.com, where um, we use, um, I mean, one of the problems in an educational context is you have one teacher and many uh, people in the classroom and uh, you, you can't be sort of sympathetic to each person's educational needs. Uh, what we've tried to do is to um, uh, augment the teacher by giving them a Tool, which um, so it, it gives problems to each of the kids in the classroom and it can uh, monitor how well they're doing so if they're achieving well it will push them onto the new aspect but if it can see that um, something's a problem it'll take them back down and if that's repetitively uh, happening it then asks for the teacher to intervene because then you need a sort of human to help manage the psychology of how um, uh, how to uh, pass through this problem that they're having. So, so I think there's a really um, powerful role that, um, that the AI can play. Also in taking um, the learning of students in the past and seeing what was successful um, and then helping the teacher to say, well, you know, this seems to be a very good strategy that worked in the past. Um, uh, so I think that there's really exciting uh, prospect for, for AI in education. Um, but I, I think there's um, uh, there's an issue of access that we need to be very careful with here, and we're already seeing this in this this particular period that we're in, where um, education at the moment, to, my kids are uh, learning. They're they're not allowed to go to school. Um, they're learning uh, using the uh, Zoom lessons and uh, everything like this. Um, and uh, but there's a whole strata of society which does not have ex access to technology and it is being is missing out at the moment on uh, on their education and it's becoming a, a, a hugely political issue about the fact that that you know we as a society are um, uh, are starving uh, uh, the most needy of, of their education at the moment because they don't have access to these tools maybe they have one computer but there are five kids in the family and who's got the computer that day um, so I think um, you know we have to be very careful with uh, introducing technology into uh, the classroom to make sure that we have an equality of access. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we have some a uh, couple more things to readings, and then we'd like to have you uh, relate to the question that I put to you before about truth and logic in today's post-corona world. Zevi, would you like to direct this? אורנה, יש לך איזה קטע לקרוא על הקריפטולוגיה של הערבים. בשמחה. הערבים בימי שושלת בית עבאס הם שהתחילו לפתח את הקריפטואנליזה, תורת פענוח הצפנים. מלומד בן המאה התשיעית, יעקוב אלקינדי, הבין שבקטע טקסט יש כמה אותיות שמופיעות שוב ושוב, בעוד שאותיות אחרות מופיעות לעיתים נדירות, כפי שאפשר לראות לעיל. שחקני שבצנה מודעים היטב לתופעה, ערכה של האות E הוא רק נקודה אחת, מכיוון שהיא האות הנפוצה ביותר באלפאבית האנגלי, ואילו ערכה של Z הוא עשר נקודות. בכתבים שונים, לכל, עת, לכל אות יש אישיות מיוחדת משלה, ועם זאת, המפתח לניח, לניתוח שביצע אל קינדי, הוא ההבנה שאישיותה של אות לא משתנה כשהיא מיוצגת באמצעות סמל שונה. דרך אגב, זאביק, לחובבי ההיסטוריה, זה בדיוק מה ש... עם זה אליזבת הרגה את מרי באנגליה, אנגליה וסקוטלנד, ומאז יש ממלכה מאוחדת. <laughs> כן, הקטע הבא זה יואב סמית, עמוד 268, יואב. זה הסיפור של טינטין, יואב, אתה איתנו? איך הצילה המתמטיקה הטינטין? 
באסירי השמש, ספר הקומיקס של רז'ה, נכלא העיתונאי הבלגי הצעיר טינטין בידי בני שבט האינקה, אחרי ששוטט בתוך המקדש של אל השמש. בני האינקה דנים את טינטין ואת חבריו, קפטון הדוק ופרופסור אלקולוס, לשרפה על המוקד. האש תוצת על ידי זכוכית מגדלת שתמקד את קרני השמש בערימת ענפים. אלא שלטינטין ניתנת הזכות לבחור את זמן ההוצאה להורג. האם יוכל להשתמש בה כדי להציל את עצמו ואת חבריו? טינטין מבצע את החישובים הדרושים, ומבין כי בתוך מספר ימים ייראה מן האזור ליקוי חמה, ולכן הוא מחליט שההוצאה להורג תתבצע בזמן הליקוי. למעשה, מישהו אחר ביצע את החישובים, הוא קורא את התחזית בפיסה לתיקון. זמן קצר לפני הליקוי, זועק טינטין, אל השמש לא יקשיב לתפילותיכם, או שמש נפלאה, אם רצונך שנחיה, תני לנו סימן כעת. ובדיוק כפי שחסתה המתמטיקה, נעלמת השמש, ובני, השמ... ובני השבט המבועטים משחררים מטינטין וטיבידה. כן, אני חושב שנסיים עם הקטע של מאיר עוזיאל, שמשלים את הסיפור על טינטין. אני מוכרח להעיר רק, בתור אסטרונום, שליקוי חמה לוקח מספר שעות. ככה שהתיאור הזה הוא לא מדויק. זאת אומרת, הליקוי עצמו הוא שתיים-שלוש אה, דקות, אבל השמש מתחילה להיעלם בהדרגה כמה שעות לפני כן. ככה שהטריק הזה לא כל כך עובד. צבי, חששתי שתבלבן אותנו עם עובדות. אנחנו... נמשיך, נמשיך לסיפור. הסיפור הגיוני, למרות שלא לוקח מספר דקות. המשך הסיפור. הוא הזהיר אותה, והנה גם פה זה מופיע. במספר 19 יש חשיבות גם בחישובים של טינטין, כמו ששאלנו נפרדים, מכיוון רצף ליקויי החמה והלבנה. חוזר על עצמו גם הוא בכל 19 שנים. ההתרחשות באסירי השמש, בספר אסירי השמש, מבוססת על רגע מפורסם בהיסטוריה, כאשר מגלה הארצות כריסטופר קולומבוס, משתמש בליקוי לבנה ולא בליקוי חמה, כדי להציל את אנשי הצוות שלו שננטשו בג'מייקה ב-1503. תחילה היו תושבי המקום ידידותיים, אבל בשלב מסוים נשאו עוינים. וסרבו לתת או לספק הספקה לקולומבוס ולצוותו. למראה אנשיו הצפויים לגבור ברעב, עלתה בדעתו של קולומבוס תוכנית ערמומית. הוא בדק את האלמנה שלו, שזה ספר המשמש ספנים מניבות, ובו תחזיות של זמני הגאות, של המחזורים הירכיים ושל מיקומי הכוכבים, וגילה כי בקרוב עומד להתרחש ניקוי לבנה ב-29 בפברואר 1504. קולומבוס כינס את הילדים שלושה ימים לפני האירוע ואיים עליהם, אם לא יביאו אספקה, הוא יגרום לירח להיעלם. מרקס, מרקס, זו הזדמנות שלנו לומר היי לשני, ואולי יש שתי דברים שהיא יכולה לעשות, אחת מהן היא לקרוא לך לבית, ואחת מהן היא לקרוא לך לבית, ואחת מהן היא לקרוא לך לבית, ואחת מהן היא לקרוא לך לבית. is translate the Hebrew parts to English. Uh, yeah. so with, with your indulgence uh, on the uh, breakfast scene, we would like to hear your answer or your comment on the post-corona world, truth and logic uh, in the world and the fake news and, and the social media, and what's your take on this? I think that uh, you saw a very clever political move being made by populist parties which was to undermine um the role of the expert we had it uh played in the brexit debate for example where uh michael gove um who certainly believes in you know he was the education minister for many years um but uh he made a statement which somehow stuck um in, in the debate which is we've had enough of experts and this was it was such a clever move because uh, on the part of the brexit um a part uh movement because it completely pulled the rug under any um economist for example that wanted to argue that the impact that um coming out of europe would have uh, on the economy uh, would be disastrous but by saying we've had enough of experts it completely in sort of uh, invalidated uh, anything they would try to say so um i think you've seen this as a, a very um uh dangerous um but uh 
in, in some sense, clever political move um, by parties that are trying to uh, appeal to a, a populist movement, try to appeal to people who perhaps, um, uh, yeah, maybe are tired of listening to expert um, advice on things. I think there's another element to this, which is, you know, scientists especially have to be very careful about um, saying uh, absolutes. Um, the news and politicians would very much like to have a yes, no answer to things. Um, uh, and, and I think this relates to the, the book that I wrote after the number mysteries, which is called What We Cannot Know. And I think uh, scientists, we need to be very honest um, about situations where we have uncertainty. And uh, to fellow scientists, we're very good at doing that because if you go to any science uh, seminar, probably 50% of the time is taken with um, uh, uh, giving measures of uncertainty before you actually say the result. But uh, the media doesn't like this. They don't know how to deal with a... 95% uncertainty. So this has resulted in a, in a slightly complex issue of the relationship of the expert to uh, the, the realm of politics, where um, sometimes you'll get a, a scientist perhaps being a little bit too um, uh, absolutist about something and not and hiding the uncertainty because they're required to give a yes, no answer, or else they're um, evasive because they don't want to say because there's an uncertainty. And then that comes over as if we don't know anything and undermines the role of the expert. So I think that there's, there isn't enough literacy about uncertainty um, uh, outside in the sort of general public, which is, has caused a kind of, um, uh, an, an issue of communication problem between the, ro the role of the expert and the role of, um, say, media or politicians. What is very fascinating that I've seen uh, in this current period is suddenly that the experts are being asked back for their opinion. And um, in this particular period of COVID and coronavirus, um, uh, people are hankering after some sort of understanding of what the future might hold and what we might be able to change the parameters that are worth playing with. Is it worth um, uh, closing borders in order to try and stop this? Or actually does the, the modeling show that closing borders has no long-term effect on the number of deaths? It perhaps just slows them down. Um, people are suddenly have an appetite to want to hear from the experts again, rather than the politicians. And so, uh, but I've seen a very interesting thing happening um, in Downing Street, which is every day we have um, a press briefing at 5 p.m. from a Downing Street from one of the ministers, quite often the prime minister, um, but also alongside him will be two scientists. And very early on, uh, the government uh, were using this phrase, um, we are following the science. Uh, and what we're seeing now is that um, the science is not clear on this. It's not clear because we don't have enough data for exactly how this um, pandemic is going to pan out. Um, and it's with lack of data, there is a huge uncertainty involved. But because the, the politicians have offloaded responsibility to the scientists, um, as things go pear-shaped, they're able to um, say, well, we're not responsible for the, what's happened because we followed the science. So I, I've se I'm seeing a complete flip of um, uh, what's happened in the past, which is um, somehow the scientists and experts were marginalized um, uh, in the kind of Brexit debate, but now we're seeing the scientists used as a shield, a kind of human shield by the politicians because, um, in the UK, we've made some huge mistakes in not going into lockdown early enough, which allowed the pandemic to, to spread. But the politicians will get away with it because they've used this phrase, we're following the science from a very early point. Um, and, and so there's a, a strange thing where now experts are being used as a human shield by the politicians um, for the mistakes that they've been making in policy. Great, thank you. Uh, the, one, the one who started this, uh, we follow the science, was Angela Merkel. But she did it wisely. <laughs> she did it well. Uh, she's a scientist, so she understands what she's talking about. I mean, you know, in some extent, I think it was good that they were following a lot of the modeling and, and science. But 
and, and at the beginning I was very optimistic about, absolutely, they seem to be really listening to um, what the modeling and the scientists are saying. But again, um, it turns out that they, they um, it relates to my AI uh, comments that we need to enrich the data set and have not just one. So, and I think that one of the mistakes we seem to have made is that we uh, took a, a rather restrictive scientific um, uh, uh, kind of input and, and, the, and there's now been a, a move to, to to have a much broader uh, church of scientists uh, advising. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, um, yeah. Marcus, thank you very much. This was a, an exciting meeting, but I'd like Zev to close out and thank you for your yeah. for the meet before yeah. you go to yeah. breakfast. Yeah, we all noticed uh, Shani's, uh, Shani behind you, so now we know that the story that you told us one hour ago about the purpose of you uh, coming to the Hebrew University was a cover-up. <laughs> and uh, and uh, thank you, Shani, also for your uh, help during all these years, the last meeting in Israel and this meeting. And uh, when I'm tired of uh, uh, your husband's English, it's very, uh, I like talking to Hebrew to you, so thank you so much. And thank Relic for his English and mathematics and goodwill. And thank Adi and Shuli Schwarz for their link and all the technical help from the Technion. And uh, thank everybody. Let's uh, have a uh, good week and Hag Sameach. Bye bye. Hag Sameach. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Yeah.